barrier and infect humans. And these diseases we now see in, in, in our lifetime have a serious impact on the forensic world. The impact is actually, in the first instance, mass fatality events, which require essentially a dead body management or DVI response. That's one thing. The second thing that how this touches forensic pathology is in the early days of a zoonotic outbreak, you have to get an understanding of what the disease actually is, procure the samples for laboratory testing, and forensic pathologists are front in line on that. So every forensic pathologist knows a lot about wounding and violence, but you also have to know a lot about viral infection. And otherwise, if you don't, you will miss opportunities to serve your community. So this strict partitioning of forensic pathology into violence and unnatural death is not suitable for the 21st century. We have to expand our, our domain to sudden death, particularly in the public health context. This, of course, also uh, goes to major concepts right now with global warming, uh, war, environmental degradation. There are a whole range of environmental diseases that become hugely relevant that the forensic pathologist sees, but only if you recognize them, right? And then, uh, you know, we have an epidemic of gender-based violence right now, a pandemic of gender-based violence in the world, and simple things like characterizing and counting uh, how many people die under those circumstances is a big gap right now uh, in, in our world. And I put this slide, this picture here, to be slightly provocative. I should actually ask some of the pathologists in the audience to make a diagnosis, but I won't do that. This is a case of constrictive pericarditis, fatal constrictive pericarditis, after vaccination. So forensic pathologists also play a role in determining sort of the aftermath of systemic responses to pandemics, such as defining complications of vaccination, et cetera. So there is a, there's a huge scope for forensic pathology in global health. We have a very well-defined role in international criminal justice. That continues to be one of the major pillars of our work, and that has huge implications for capacity development. What that means is, that many countries uh, in Africa and in other parts of the world need to have um, access to knowledge and protocols and international standards to be able to detect the range of violence or causes of death that occur in the context of death in police custody, you know, other sort of interactions with um, military personnel, etc. And so, for many years, we've had the uh, Istanbul Protocol for Clinical Forensic Medicine. We now have a revised Minnesota Protocol, which is a huge landmark event in global forensic pathology because it gives you a modern, updated view on how all jurisdictions including Canadians and Americans and Europeans, need to uh, deal with death in custody. So the very key document, the Minnesota Protocol. And again, you know, there is an increased um, attention to gender-based violence and femicide. And these are perhaps less defined in the, uh, in the international criminal justice space, but, you know, over the next 20 years, we will see more and more development in that. In the humanitarian forensic action domain, um, there's lots of applications of forensic science uh, and forensic medicine in that context. Clearly, um, every forensic practitioner knows that the separation of humanitarian and criminal justice goals are um, arbitrary. They're, they're 
They're interdigitated. They're one in the same thing, except some of the international organizations like to separate them. But for us, they are as valid as a um, point of engagement as anything else. So, you know, there's a whole range of, um, of remarkable applications of humanitarian forensic action, and it started, started with the missing, the problem of the missing. And, but uh, now there's much more texture to that problem. It's not just the missing anymore. There are many other things, and partially that has been because of the application of DNA technology into various um, iterations of this problem. Obviously, I can't go through all of that today, but, but that is a huge piece of the, of the international puzzle, is this uh, continued work in the humanitarian space. And the fourth and probably the least developed aspect of international forensic pathology is research. And this has been the bane of our existence for many years in forensic science. You've heard it from other speakers. We lack a research culture. And the only way to progress our discipline is by embracing research. And this is extremely problematic because our budgets in various institutions are provided for the provision of service. It is not provided for the uh, generation of new knowledge. But that needs to change. If it doesn't change, our discipline will stagnate. So if you, uh, just one example, um, when uh, Ryan uh, ran the meeting in Blomfontein, I met uh, Sylvester Anzivois from Uganda. And he told me about a disease that had emerged in IDP camps after the war with the LRA in Uganda. And this was a strange neurological disorder that affected children. And it was devastating the northern part of Uganda. It started as an epidemic in IDP camps. So this, this is a mystery that's never been solved. And it, it reflects, um, the disease is called nodding syndrome, and you can see, you know, this boy here who is severely affected with this wasting neurological disorder. And you can see the primary pathology in the brain, which is the, cre is the deposition of aggregated tau proteins. So this is like something we never thought about when we were exhuming mass graves uh, all over the world. We never thought that forensic pathology would have a role in understanding diseases that arose in post-conflict situations, not directly related to violence, probably related to environmental damage to ecosystems, changing vectors in the, in the environment, etc. So there's this whole space of post-conflict, what happens and how can forensic pathology help understand the problems of the post-conflict world? So that's just one, one example of research, but there are many, many, many um, other examples of where research is extremely important in, in this domain. So our experience, I'm based at, uh, in Toronto at the Ontario Forensic Pathology Service. We have a state-of-the-art facility that costs um, 500 million dollars, uh, huge investment by our government, and we have had an active uh, traditional clinical fellowship training program for forensic pathologists uh, since 2004. And I'm going to basically give you an abbreviated progress report and provide you with the implications of some of the decisions that we've made and what we should do in the future for training. We have trained um, now 50 forensic pathologists in our program. Uh, they range from the a variety of countries that you can see there. And many of them have gone on to be leaders in their own jurisdictions. Now, for those of you who 
have fellowship training programs or postgraduate training programs, they're not easy to administer. Uh, they're very costly, um, and you need to be very strategic in how you do it. And, and when you think about that concept for developing capacity in Africa, and you put the two together, I have four pieces of um, experience or observations that I'd like to share with you. The first is, and I'm just going to list them out first, no jurisdiction, even in Canada, can afford to train people from other countries without philanthropic investment. It is simply not possible. We don't have the budgets for it. Even in, in rich countries, there are, there's no budget for it. Second, we've seen um, at the beginning of the training efforts for forensic pathology, that we had a very traditional single model for how to do it. It's not going to work in the 21st century. We have to have a more fluid uh, approach. We have to recognize that certain events in the world can catalyze our training efforts. And I'll spend some time looking at African centers of excellence at the end, which I think are, in fact, the single most important uh, point that I will make in this presentation. So the role of philanthropy. So all of our uh, training programs where we have um, assisted in, in developing the careers of forensic pathologists have been through um, philanthropic investment by the Raymond Chang Foundation. And I'm going to tell you the story of how that developed. But none of, our, none of these activities would have been possible without uh, an, an endowment created by Raymond Chang's family. So this is, a, this is a simple truth. If you want to develop a sustainable international training program, it has to be supported by philanthropic investment. It's very difficult to convince governments to endow funds that will exist in perpetuity for the purposes of training because they're interested in doing autopsies and toxicology and they're not interested in this broader mandate. There's been a great separation between academic and service in our discipline that has fueled this divide. So the role of philanthropy is key. And how you get philanthropists involved in this type of activity is usually precipitated by crisis. So the crisis that precipitated our um, development of, of a large endowment for training was that I was asked to participate as part of an international group uh, to observe as you know, um, this is one of the common models in international death investigation, to be an external observer on the domestic investigation of a massacre that occurred in Jamaica, where over 70 civilians uh, lost their lives related to the exchange of um, gunfire with the Jamaican Constabulary Force and the military. So this was a huge event. And uh, it was immediately obvious when we attended Jamaica that Jamaica was poised to be a, um, a, a positive regional force in forensic medicine in the whole Caribbean region. They had the institutions, they had the people, they had the will, but they did not have the um, financial support. They did not have the larger strategic engagement that is required to uh, bring that uh, goal forward. So that's when we partnered with the Raymond Chang Foundation. And Jamaica is one of our sort of early success stories because we have um, we've trained four um, absolutely fantastic pioneering forensic pathologists for Jamaica. And we continue to do this. And the model is 
just think about this before, but before we started the training program in Jamaica, there, was no, there were no Jamaican forensic pathologists. It's a shocking thing, but there were no Jamaican forensic pathologists. So what we did is we created this very traditional model where the Jamaican uh, pathologists, once they finished their basic training, came for one year to Toronto, trained in forensic pathology as fellows, and then went back home, and then you know, developed the system from there. That's a very traditional model. Uh, we'll come to whether or not that's a suitable model for Africa. I think not, uh, but I'll explain in more detail about that. The most um, important mechanism for Africa is the creation of forensic training in Africa for Africans by Africans. I mean, it's, it's almost tautological, but it, it is extremely important that this vast continent um, taps into its own expertise to develop the capacity to train their own people. And the, the place for the international community in places like uh, our facility in Toronto is to identify those individuals that would benefit from a classical training model where those people come to you know, the West, they, they spend one year in a traditional clinical fellowship training program, and then they go back with the idea of creating a larger structure in their own country. And one of the possibilities there uh, is um, being realized now with the amazing work of Adam and Cordelia in Zambia, where they, they are the pioneers of a, of a new system of forensic service delivery in Zambia. And they're doing it as graduates of our training program, but as Zambians. So in other words, there is a productive collaboration, but um, what, will, what we hope will eventually happen is Zambia and other centers um, like it will, will develop organically from this model that, that we've just described, and then they will take over the training uh, in whatever model is most suitable for their jurisdiction. So you see, instead of taking experts out of Africa, putting them in countries like Canada and the US, and continuing that sort of to and fro, the idea is to bring people who are strategically interested in systems development and, and learning forensic pathology in our context, and then the, those individuals come back and translate knowledge, build their regional capacity, and then become the training hub in their part of Africa. Um, so it, 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 it uh, reduces the, the need for bringing people out of their context all of the time. Now, the, the linkages between our center and, and, other con and other jurisdictions can continue, but it can continue in this, um, in this model where it's to stimulate development. And this, this comes to the last point, which is we really do need a diversity of approaches. So I've talked about um, you know, the traditional clinical fellowship model where you bring a person out of their country for one year, that's, that's not globally applicable. Um, it's part of one of the various options that we have to help uh, different jurisdictions build capacity, but it's not the answer for all. And I, I contrast this um, concept by looking at the Central African Republic um, versus Uganda, and you know there there are they are miles apart in terms of their general level of development, um, and in their specific areas of forensic capacity, Uganda is well resourced, 
and the Central African Republic virtually has nothing. So a traditional fellowship training model is not going to work in, uh, in the Central African Republic. It would very e easily be, could be used to develop further expertise in Uganda, but you need to have a different approach for these two circumstances. And what we have not done in global forensic pathology, and I, would, I suspect it's the same thing in global forensic science, is that we have not developed more flexible mechanisms for countries like the Central African Republic. So if we are going, if we, you know, as profession, forensic professionals from all over the world, want to assist in building capacity in the Central African Republic, what does that look like? You know, that's a very compelling and interesting question. So I think, you know, we, we need to really think about the diversity of approach um, and how overseas resources are utilized. And I come back to my central point, and that is that this ultimately will be fueled by philanthropy. It, it does seem to be the most sustainable mechanism. I'm not saying it's the only mechanism. We need to have many, many different overlapping mechanisms, both strategically and with funding, to get to this uh, result in the end, I think. So, um, so we need flexibility, we need diversity of approaches. We can't just sit in the old traditional training models. And I think the goal, in my mind, has switched from training individuals to, to go back home to training individuals to become leaders in their discipline and create regional capacity to develop those around them and you know their own people. So I think you know, and that's you know, people like um, like me and Stephen Cordner and Duarte Nuno Vieira, we we buy into that model and we think that that is a successful approach. So in terms of closing remarks, having uh, having had some experience with. Uh, working in Africa over the years, I actually think that Africa is the, is the stage at the moment. I think you, um, all African forensic practitioners in this room and your colleagues who are not with us, um, will grow and develop forensic medicine in this century. Not just for Africa, because once the fire starts, uh, with this type of uh, development and capacity building, you will create all of the new knowledge that will come from the diverse medical legal challenges that you have in Africa. So I really think that um, you know, the, the emphasis is going to shift progressively over this century uh, to Africa. Um, the, I think I've shown you that the benefits to society are not simply in the courts. And that's a big challenge for, for all forensic-minded people. We tend to be very hardwired to the criminal justice, but we need to look at a broader landscape of engagement. And in forensic medicine, global public health is very straightforward, uh, a new application. And we all have to work together to convince philanthropists to invest. <laughs> and international funders, etc. Not easy, it takes a lot of time and effort. And finally, I'd like to, uh, to acknowledge uh, Bridget and Andrew Chang, who are the um, generous donors for our training program, and uh, my collaborator, Sylvester Ansevois from uh, Uganda, Stephen Cordner, Cordner Morris Tidbal Bins, and the various organizations that I've worked with uh, over the years, including the Argentine team, which is represented in spirit here, uh, you know, who have made huge contributions. Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you, Michael, for a really insightful contribution to our program today. Now that there are more people in the room, I wanted to say just uh, good morning, bonjour, malvazi. 
Um, I also wanted to say Happy Women's Day to every woman in the room. <clears throat> and then I want to take just one moment to say thank you to every man in the room who supports our cause of women. So our next speaker is Dr. Vanessa Lynch. Vanessa Lynch is the Regional Director of DNA for Africa, which she created for a network in Africa around forensic DNA profiling. She works in policy and law and has driven the adoption of DNA laws in South Africa. You all know uh, about the wonderful work that she's done in that context. She truly connects forensic experts and change advocates and policymakers around the world to fight crime and assist humanitarian efforts. And Vanessa, if this is not the shortest introduction you've ever had, I want to see it. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to start off by saying thank you to Michael. Where are you? Um, I, I feel slightly embarrassed that this room was empty when you had the most amazing, amazing information to share with all of us. And I think this is something, as passionate as I am about Africa and being an African, that we need to work on our time because we miss opportunities like this. And if we're going to step up, we need to step in. And I'm sorry, I just had to say that because it was an amazing presentation. Yeah. <laughs> So um, I've only got 10 minutes. I have the option of talking very fast and then losing it in translation or just trying to um, really just give an overall um, presentation today around why we need policy to develop DNA infrastructures within Africa. Essentially, when we're looking at DNA, we're not only looking at the criminal justice sector, we're looking at the humanitarian sector. And we're starting to understand, specifically within Africa, it's not just about justice, it's about migration, identification, human trafficking, conflict. And all of these things can be assisted through the identification of either perpetrators or human beings. And that is why the intersection of humanitarian and um, forensic science in the justice sector is so important. And I'm just going to give you an understanding of, of how policy can change two specific scenarios. So, for instance, if a child is reported missing, there's no DNA that's taken either from the personal effects of the child or the parents. There's no DNA database against which you can search any profiles. The unidentified remains may be found with no distinguishing features. That body remains unclaimed and that child is not identified. And, and this is not just a scenario. Um, these are cases that I hear about all the time of human remains lying in mortuaries for years, often buried and unclaimed when in fact 24 hours could have put that person back to their family. If a child is reported missing and you've got some kind of database in place and you take a profile from the child, as well, hum, uh, their, their effects as well as from the parents, there's a possibility through a database search that that child is going to be identified. We've seen this happen and I'm going to show you some um, uh, databases that we can still use even if we don't policy where we can really start ensuring that burials that are taking place by the thousands within Africa where human remains are not identified can be avoided. Where there are no laws in place and you don't have a DNA database, you can have a person who's arrested, um, no DNA taken, they perhaps have a common assault uh, case against them, they released it in a couple of months, specifically in South Africa, they in a month or so, um, and they're released on parole and they go back into society. That same person, if we have a DNA database, if a profile is taken, from either an arrestee or a convicted offender, as the case may be, the profile is on a database, there's a good chance that there's a match specifically because we know that serial offenders exist in South Africa and possibly without, um, throughout Africa with sexual offenses particularly, that you're going to link it to other unsolved cases. And this particular case is actually a case in South Africa where a perpetrator who was a convicted offender because of our laws had their profile taken on a common assault and it did link to 30 unsolved rapes. Now that person would either have gone back into society and continued his rampage, undoubtedly he was a serial offender. In this case he was obviously imprisoned for life. 
So why, when we know about the benefits, does it remain so limited in Africa? And there are a number of reasons. Obviously, in the context of this presentation, we want to look at how policies can actually change that. Why, are more, why aren't more African countries adopting policies that can really start developing their DNA databases and their DNA laws to stop this um, rampant crime when you're not identifying serial offenders, as well as um, human uh, remains being identified? Obviously, you require political will. You require funding. Michael spoke about funding, and it is something that we need more agencies to assist African countries to develop their policies in order to create databases. And really, when you look at a policy, and why I'm talking about policy, a policy is the first step towards adopting a law. And a policy is something that the country needs to adopt to make sure that the context within their own region really makes sense to them. In South Africa, obviously, we have a very strong constitution, and our DNA policy had to be addressed first before we could look at actually drafting a bill that suited our country and uh, was understood within the context of our laws and, and, and our constitution. From the policy, you can then move on to drafting bills, which then become laws, and then you can start getting into the finer details of the regulations that speak to the laws, as well as standard operating procedures, which really go down into the detail. So how are we addressing this? Because I don't want to walk away and just say, well, it's a good idea. We need to go away with, a, with the next step as to how can we actually start doing this within our countries. The DNA Policy Board for Africa has been convened, and the, these are the six of us that are on it. And essentially what we are looking for is really to develop a policy that can be given as an open source document on a platform that can be provided to other countries in order for them to start looking at adopting their own policies. We do not have to reinvent the wheel. We also have to understand that we don't plug and play in Africa to to policies that might exist in the West and the East and the North. We have very specific context, very specific challenges within Africa, and therefore it makes sense to have a policy that can be adopted that is understood within our particular context. So the aims of the board are really to start looking at having a list as to what is required when you put a policy together in order for you to create a framework for your own DNA regulations. And we're doing this at the moment, and we hope to be able to put this on an open platform and ultimately to be able to um, uh, have the African Union and other organizations endorse this policy so that other countries can use this as a start to ultimately putting laws into place. So when you're looking at your own country in terms of a scoping mission, that is when you look at your country and go, okay, what do we need? You have to understand what is the purpose? What is the greatest purpose of needing it? Is it for humanitarian? Is there a lot of migration, human trafficking? Is sexual offense a huge issue, such as it is in South Africa? The purpose of your database. Who and what crimes need to be um, on that database? Um, often countries start with the most serious offenses and then ultimately increase it, but to start off with very serious offenses, either sexual offenses or murder what particular crimes in South Africa. We have a Schedule 8 um, list of crimes, which is where we started in terms of the types of crimes that um, you can arrest somebody for and take their DNA sample to put on the database. When and what scenario, that really ties into, you know, who is on the database, which types of crimes, and the scenarios within which you are taking DNA sampling. And this also looks at how a sample is taken. Please don't allow, don't give the, um, the, the job of taking a, a, a buckle sample to a doctor. We had to really fight for this in South Africa. It is a very simple procedure that the police, if they are trained, can in fact do. The, the crime scene samples, in, in obviously in, in sexual assault cases and, and, and other cases, that is, that is for a medical doctor or a forensic nurse. But these are the type of things that you need to look at in your scoping mission. Who is going to take your sample? What will you do with the samples? Are they going to be destroyed? In South Africa, for instance, our buckle samples, once a profile has been uplifted um, and put onto the database, we then destroy the buckle sample, but crime scene samples are not destroyed. These are the types of conversations that you need to have to adopt into your policy. 
who has access to the database, as well as the operation of that database when our profiles expunged, and obviously penalties for any abuse in respect of those um, uh, uh, who, who are using it for purposes other than what's it intended. And understand that if you don't currently have a DNA framework in place, but you do have a forensic science laboratory, you actually don't have a regulatory framework. And for me, that is far more dangerous than actually having a DNA framework in place. Countries are very nervous about putting laws in place because they think that they're now taking samples. But if you already have an infrastructure in place, you need to regulate it. It is a safer process in order for you to manage your data. And obviously, in looking at a database, try and have an understanding that actually humanitarian and direct DNA matching for offences are very separate. People often won't come forward to give a family sample in the respect of a missing person if they feel that the database is going to be searched and they might be linked to a crime. They are very separate, and if, if you are establishing a database, do that from the get-go, because there is, there is a merit um, in being able to um, encourage people to come forward in the case of human remains. And just closing, if you aren't currently um, in the, in the um, space that you have a policy in place, and hopefully we are going to work towards having more countries that will have policies and laws in place, there are actually ways, if you have a forensic science laboratory, to be able to work on a case-by-case -case basis, load those profiles onto either Interpol's our familiar database or their offender database, um, as well as be able to use the FBI's CODA system to use it in your laboratory to do simple searches. So let's have more collaboration, um, meetings like this, talks like this, workshops where we can talk about policy in order for us to really take this forward um, and to be able to see more regions adopting frameworks that are really going to enhance their forensic capacity. So I got my 10 minutes. I can see Antonal's getting a bit itchy there, but um, please make sure that you join us today at 5 o'clock where we've got a wonderful panel discussion where we're talking further about this using DNA um, to identify the missing and the deceased. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vanessa. Um, yes, I'm not taking uh, allowing questions at the moment so that we can stay on track. But please engage with our speakers. You hear how engaging they are, how committed they are. So please um, do that. Um, I'm now introducing, calling to the stage, Dr. Ahmed. I just don't see, you. there you are. Uh, also, Ahmed, the smallest, uh, shortest introduction you've ever had in your life. Um, he is the Senior Migrant uh, Protection Assistant Advisor of the Department of Health and Humanitarian Affairs and social development, where he's responsible for the dossiers on climate change and migration, missing mi migrants, and the focal person for the African Climate M Mobility Initiative. Uh, his entire full CV uh, is not on, in the book, but what is there is impressive, so please look at it. Amit, I hand over to you. Good morning. I would like to join Antonin and say happy Women's Day to everyone, and to say Happy Women's Day to my mom. I think since yesterday people were paying tribute to their mother. She was the first person who taught me how to respect a woman. Um, this morning I want to talk to you about, um, or just share with you, about the need and the benefits of using uh, DNA and forensic um, sciences for the identification of migrants and their return to uh, their families. But just to give you an introduction and uh, to tell you why this is so important. Um, Africa is the world's largest, um, also the second most populous continent in the world. Um, yesterday, I think that there was a, a map that was shown here that didn't show justice. If you look at the the world map, Africa is the smallest, or in relation to even America. But if you look at Africa as a continent, not only are we massive in size, but also we second in population to Asia, and also the most populous next to Asia. Also, Africa has the youngest population. It is believed or predicted that we have an average um, 
the average age in Africa is 20 years old. And over 75% of this continent is below, is 35 years or below. But the most important thing is also is that not only is Africa as a continent shaped by migration or mobility for years until our borders were drawn by colonialism, but also is the most mobile even today. Yesterday, I think someone made uh, some statistics, over 88%, and we did a mapping from the African Union, 88% of mobility is within the continent itself. Whether within the same country, rural urban migration is increasing as a result of climate change in particular, but you also have a mobility between countries because let's say Rwanda and East Congo is the same people same language groups, same traditions. And so mobility across borders within Africa is increasing. But it's something to know that although Africa is the most mobile continent in the world, it is the most restrictive. For example, a Rwandan person cannot go to South Africa freely. Or a person from Ghana, like myself, unless you are within the ECOWAS region, you cannot travel to Algeria or Tunisia. As you hear what happened, the Tunisian government, the president actually made a statement that sub-Saharan Africans, I don't like the word sub-Sahara because Africa is one Africa, that black Africans are trying to change the demographics of North Africa. And that means that there are some areas of Africa where you don't see an African as an African. And again, it goes back to colonialism, where our boundaries were drawn and our cultures were hit against each other. Which means that on this continent, the causes of human mobility are many. Of course, I just put uh, some few things here. So, so economic reasons. Although Africa is the most resourced, it is the poorest in the world. We are ravaged by disease, conflict, our resources are plundered, we are used as raw material places, no manufacturing. And yet, Africa has the highest grow, growth, population growth rates. And so young people are left without work. Just walk out of this city and you see young people walking. Some of them just walking, looking for something to do in a day. It's not only typical of Rwanda, it's everywhere. And so, as a result, we have internal conflict, tribal conflict, interregional conflicts. And even worse now, because of climate change, resources are becoming depleted. So you have people fighting, like pastoralists fighting to have control of the resources. And therefore, climate change has become an existential threat to the development of the continent itself. It is projected by the World Bank that by 2030, in, 70, in seven years from now, over 23 million Africans will be displaced within the continent. And most of them will be young people looking for opportunity for work. That does not include the people who are trying to leave Africa and go to other places just in terms of having to put food on the table for their family. So I come back to this question, why is DNA and forensic uh, technology important as a tool? And I think yesterday, Peter, you, you, you said something. The basic thing about forensic sciences or forensic medicine is that it is to meet the needs of people. That's why we're talking about it here. And a migrant is a person. Behind the word migrant is a human being. So whoever you will, you will meet on, in a mortuary is a person might be dead, but still a person, and deserve the dignity and the treatment of that dignity. In Africa, because young people do not have opportunities, or because of economic difficulties, many families see their children traveling as heroes to provide for their families. There are people here in this room, if they do not earn a month, their families will go to bed hungry. 
Therefore, these migrants that we're talking about are heroes. Sometimes they are vilified because of lack of legal pathways. We close our borders and we do not allow people to travel because we think that they are a threat to us. I don't believe that a person is illegal. There's no illegal migrant. There is a person who has entered into a country illegally. There's a difference between the person being illegal and the person having broken an immigration law. The worst part of it is that you get the person, you try the person and deport the person back to their country. But why are people willing to take such dangerous means to pay smugglers or traffickers because you cannot travel legally? Even sometimes when you have the money to pay for a visa, you will not get the visa especially in Europe, or going to Europe, or America, or anywhere. And so people are forced to move. And as the legal pathways dwindle, as I was giving you the issue, the example of Tunisia, we're going to have the risks of people going missing or people being dead. Because they will take all means to leave their countries, to leave their homes, to find a better life. If you deserve it, they deserve it. So, what happens when someone dies? I have lived and worked on the island of Malta, and I think that Professor Emilio said it yesterday, and I've worked in this sector for the past 20 years. And most of the migrants who came by boat from Libya, trying to reach Italy through Malta, we've scooped thousands of bodies. And as a legal person, I've had to actually, as an African, go and sign all their death certificate. It is very easy in Europe to collect samples of people because it is required by law. But as Vanessa said, in Africa we don't have the capacity and we don't do it. When someone dies in the desert, let's say Niger or Chad desert, all they do is religious reason, they open a grave, they bury you. Your identity is not even known. So your family is home expecting that you are alive but you are dead. But you see the thing is that many African migrants move in groups or they go to a place and they go to a group. If I had to migrate to Rwanda, the first person I would look for is a Ghanaian or Nigerian because I want to identify with them. Second thing I would do is go to a mosque or go to a church. So the identity of African migrants is known. The problem is when they die, their families will know. I can tell you, anyone who died in Malta between 2002 and 2021, I have their records in my office. And I was able to inform their family. The problem is, in Malta, we have a record. What if they died in Niger? What if they died in Mali? What if they died in Libya? There is no record. So although people will phone the family and say, listen, your son, your daughter is dead, but we cannot trace the person because no DNA data is taken. In Malta, we can trace the person very easily. I can take you to even the grave where the person is buried. So it is important that we know that people deserve to return to their families in dignity for burial. Because for us Africans, a dead person is not dead. You're still part of your family. That burial, that traditional burial, that mourning is part of the process of closure. We live in communities, and therefore, we deserve to take that person back home. But also, the families deserve to have the person home. And therefore, DNA, or forensic science, becomes a tool that we can accord these people this dignity. Just one minute, and I will stress this as a lawyer, it is a fundamental right enshrined under law that every person is born with dignity. Not just right. Your right might cease at, at death, but your dignity does not cease. That is why, you know, when we saw the queen die, they spent all that money showing us in the world how important the queen is. But every human being, queen or no queen, you have dignity. You might be born from, from a poor family, but you have dignity. The second thing is the right to migrate is enshrined in law. You have a right to leave your country and go to a different country. And you have a right to migrate within your own country. And finally, you have a right to seek asylum under humanitarian law. 
And in Africa, the right to asylum is seen as an act of family. No African is a refugee in Africa. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ahmed. I'm always in awe when you, when you, um, when you speak. To just note your passion and the the common uh, message that that resonates with so much of so many of us. Next, I uh, do not see John. Can you just indicate? Oh, you are there. Thank you. So next, I in, uh, introduce to you uh, John. Mungai, he is the head of uh, Forensic Science Service and, and Government Chemist Department, the Ministry of Interior Coordination of the National Government of Kenya. John, please, I apologize also for the short introduction, but let's stay on time. The floor is yours. Good morning, all. Yeah, my name is John Kimani Mungai. I'll talk about issues of forensic science that aided in the tracking down of a, a top Al-Qaeda terrorist within the cells of East Africa from 1998 when we had a bomb blast in Nairobi and Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. So such to the dates and the events that took place on 7th day of August 1998 at around 10.30 a.m. This was in Nairobi, Kenya, when people were going with their morning activities. There was a big bomb blast targeting the American Embassy, Kenya, and 219 people died within a short time. 10, 30 minutes later, at around 10.45 a.m., there was another blast in Dar es Salaam targeting the American embassy in Tanzania. 11 people died. In these two blasts, more than 4,000 people were injured and people and property destroyed. The attack, the attack type was a car bomb that was driven into these embassies. That was the, the backside of the American embassy in Nairobi. On 28th November 2002, a vehicle crashed through a barrier at Paradise Hotel in Malindi. Malindi is within the coastal region of Kenya. It blew up and 15 people died and 80 injured. The same day, two surface-to-air missiles fired at a chartered Boeing 757 Akea airlines that was flying from Mombasa to Tel Aviv, Israel. In all the attacks above, the Al-Qaeda, a terrorist group, admitted responsibility. The main suspect in these two attacks was a person called Fazul, Mohammed Fazul. Fazul remained a fugitive and efforts by the Kenyan and the United States government to bring him to justice remained unsuccessful. But after Fazul took off after the blast in 1998, he forgot two very crucial evidences that would be used to track him down. He forgot his family back. He forgot his wife and forgot his two daughters. So DNA samples were taken from the wife DNA samples were taken from the two daughters and preserved. The evidence that was given that about the disappearance of Fazul was given by the landlady where Fazul had rented a house, an acquaintance who was a close friend to Fazul, and also some of the students since Fazul was a madras teacher. The mobile data Fazul was in contact with the suicide bombers at Paradise Hotel and also the person who, who crashed the vehicle into the hotel in Malindi. The mobile data was confirmed by his wife and the, and the landlady since they used to be in contact frequently. On the second day of August, year 2008, 
The Anti-Terrorism Police Unit in Malind, Kenya, received intelligence report that Fazul had been cited in a cyber cafe in Malindi. The police proceeded to the cyber cafe. They found an accused person leaving the cyber cafe and arrested him. A flash disk was recovered from one of his pockets. The father, learning that his son had been arrested, rushed to the police station. I don't know what would have happened to this. Rushed to the police station to find out what would have happened to his son. He was also arrested. They went to the house of this man, and they found the following items. An electric shaver, two passports, one earlier stolen from Isli Estate in Nairobi, and was manipulated and falsified, and there was Fasul's photo on it. There were nine Friday bulletin magazines with Muslim news updates. One of them had the story of the bombers at the Paradise Hotel, while another had the photograph of Fazul Abdullah. The contents of the flash disk was headed the Al-Qaeda generation. The 920-page document had a dedication to Abdullah Hassan, the suicide bomber of the American Embassy in Nairobi on 7th August, 1998. The author introduces himself as born in Comoros, and this is where Fazul came from. Reference to his marriage to Amina Kabura Mohammed, who was the wife to Fazul. DNA profiles were generated from the swap from the electric shaver that was recovered from the home of the accused persons. The DNA profiles generated was conclusion that the shaver was used by the father to the two girls and Fazul's wife. On 11th June 2011, DNA samples were taken from the remains of a man killed in Somalia, thought to be Abdullah Fazul. They were stopped on a military roadblock. Instead of stopping, they fired at the military, and the military were forced to kill the three people inside the vehicle. DNA samples were obtained from the three people, and one of them, conclusion is that the DNA profiles match the one from the Sheva that was gotten from the house in Nairobi. The issues that were, came up during the trial during this case was, was Fazul or whoever was his real name ever the accused person's house? If he was in the accused house, did they know that he had committed mass murders at the U.S. Embassy in Nairobi and Paradise Hotel in Kambala? If he was ever in the house, did they harbor him knowing that he was unlawfully present in Kenya? Did the accused persons steal passport number that? In the alternative, did they handle it knowing it to be stolen or un unlawfully obtained? Did the accused persons alter the passport by substituting the photograph of the lawful holder with that of Fazul Abdullah Mohammed? Those are the issues that came up during the trial in this case. Since the two people, that is the father and the son, were aligned in court for harboring a fugitive. Forensic evidence that we all know that every contact leaves a trace that is Edmund Lockhart's. The DNA profiles generated from the shaver, while compared to those obtained from the family members and the human remains in Somalia, proved beyond any reasonable doubt that Fazul Mohammed had been to the home of the accused persons. Convictions on the fifth day of February 2019, the father and son were sentenced to life imprisonment as the law stipulates the case they have appealed against this sentence. So my presentation is dedicated to all those people all those people, their lives in the embassy bombings in Nairobi, Kenya, and the Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. I would wish to thank Bilal Sabal of ICRC, Dr. Vanessa Salange, the local organizations of ASFM, for supporting and enabling me to attend the conference. Asante Nisana.
We have, we have time for a question. Yes, a question back there. Go ahead, sir. Your mic should be on. Is there a microphone on your desk? If not, just step, step to a microphone, please. Oh, there's a, a roaming microphone. Thank you. We have one minute left for questions. Okay, good morning. Uh, I'm Usman Lee. I'm a pathologist by profession. Uh, my question goes to um, Dr. Michael. Um, but, um, uh, Dr. Can Ize I just stop you for a second? Okay. I apologize, sir. I meant, is there a question for... Uh, John Mukai, we, oh, after no. the session, if there's time left, we will okay. open the floor okay. for general questions. I apologize, I should have made that more clear. So then we move on. Our next speaker uh, needs no introduction, but <laughs> it is appropriate that I say a few words at least. Um, Dr. Bruce Bedoli worked in the FBI's uh, laboratory division to carry out research, development, and validation of methods for forensic biological analysis. He has published more papers than I can uh, name, 700 plus, uh, made hundreds of presentations, and ordered and authored many books. Uh, Bruce also recently retired as the director of the Center for Human Identification and Regents Professor at the University of North Texas Health Science Center at Fort Worth in Texas. He remains, or he is a stellar example for all of us of a retirement is not the end of staying involved in forensic sciences. And we laud you for that, Bruce. He continues to do research and work in the areas of forensic genomics and contributes to supporting humanitarian efforts via human identification. He, Bruce Bedoli is currently a visiting professor in the Department of Forensic Medicine at the, at the University of Helsinki and an adjunct professor of Forensic Science Institute at Radford University. Bruce, I hand over to you. Well, thank you. So, um, thank you for be allowing me to be here. Merci beaucoup. I want to appreciate Michael's presentation earlier this morning because he laid down a foundation of what the pathologist is encountering and what we all are encountering. And I'd like to, to jump off from what Michael presented to address some of the things that we'll talk about here today. So I'm going to talk a little bit about bioterrorism. Michael talked about the greatest bioterrorist of all, Mother Nature the one who created most of the lethal weapons that we know of in the microbial world, um, what some of the microbial forensics may be and the responsibilities that we have to address this, this threat. I'm going to talk about the pathologist's responsibilities, lead into a molecular autopsy, pharmacogenomics, and then, if time permits, uh, some human identification and informed consent. So in the 21st century, things have changed a lot from the way that we used to look at the world. In the United States, we had a terrorist event in 2001, and immediately on the heels of that event was a bioterrorism attack. And so what we used to think of as natural, everything natural became a threat from that day onward. One used to think that bioterrorism wasn't a real practical event. They used to say something like a submarine from you know, some country would spew out a cloud of some microbe onto New York's harbor, onto the city. But this was a very difficult thing to perpetrate. And therefore, no one really took it seriously because microbes are rather uh, fragile and they don't like to exist in the conditions of, uh, that they may have been exposed. That all changed with a very simple mechanism to disseminate microbes. A, a, a um, culture, dried spores of Bacillus anthracis, the etiological agent of anthrax, were placed into letters and mailed out to a number of um, organizations and politicians and newscasters, and they were exposed to a pathogen. It was a very simple mechanism, 
and it did have an effect. This was the individual who was first identified to have died from the exposure, but at that time, it was a covert operation. No one knew it occurred. There was no letter found. He died being in, um, on vacation about several states away from where he was exposed. There were several other individuals who were exposed or died due to this, and um, that created a whole new challenge for us in the United States and around the world. Now, we spent billions of dollars on biodefense, and most people would say that's crazy because so you had one event, why should we worry? But I submit to you that bioterrorism is not something that is new. It has been perpetrated for millennia. In fact, the Romans, in fact, six centuries before the Romans, common warfare was to take dead, decaying bodies and throw it into the water supply of your enemies. They did not know what the cause was, but they knew what the outcome was. In the 14th century, the Tartars were laying siege to the city of Kaffa up in the Ukraine, and they came down with the plague. And so they decided to turn their disadvantage to an advantage and catapulted their dead comrades over the walls to, to infect the, the citizens within the city. And this, they believe, actually helped uh, promulgate the bubonic plague of the 14th century. When the Spanish and British came to the New World, they met a population of people who were immune naive to measles and smallpox. And in fact, there are good records that they used um, infected blankets and clothing to actually kill the Native Americans. And more Native Americans died from exposure to pathogens than they did by conventional weapons. A very interesting one was the Germans during World War I had a clandestine lab in the United States. And the war fighting back in that time frame is very different than war fighting that proceeded after World War I, and cavalry was very important. So what they were doing was culturing Burkholderia mallei, the pathogen that causes a disease known as glanders in horses. They would go down to the stockyards and put wounds in them and infect the horses, which would then be sent overseas to the, to the war with the hope they would infect other horses and mules and such. Never could find the records on whether that was successful, but it shows how easy it is to hide a surreptitious uh, laboratory, clandestine laboratory system. World War II, the Japanese dropped uh, plague-infested fleas on China. There was a cult in 1984 that settled in the state of Oregon, and there was going to be some voting to change the way the land was held, and it was going to affect the cult. So what they did is they took salmonella, tifimurium, and uh, spread it over salad bars with the idea that many people would become ill and they wouldn't vote, and therefore they could win the election in their favor. They still lost the election, so I don't know what that all planned to be. Um, in Dallas, Texas, not too far away from where I used to work, there were muffins in a break room, and people saw the muffins. So what do people do? They eat the muffins. Some of them took the muffins home with them. And it turned out that Shigella was in the muffins. It may point out that you wouldn't expect to find Shigella in baked muffins. And yet when they were consumed, they came down with shigellosis. Turned out it was a nurse. A nurse had just uh, put him in there and put him out in the break room. No one knows why she would do that. Interestingly, she had a boyfriend who kept coming down with you know, sepsis. And it turns out she was very kind to him, giving him B12 shots. And I would submit to you, if any loved one you have is offering B12 shots, you should not take it. Because the history has not been good for all those. And if we had time, I'd tell you about HIV stories and B12 shots. The last one I want to talk about is a well-known cult, the Am Shinrikyo, who um, actually was the one who perpetrated the sarin nerve gas in the subway in Tokyo back in the 1990s. They also um, perpetrated bioterrorism, or attempted to. Their leader, Shoka Asahara, was a rather dynamic cult leader, and he had great ambitions. They, um, they attempted to acquire Ebola. They worked with their, you know, aerosolizing anthrax and botulinum toxin, and they tried to acquire quite a lot of other um, um, microbes for their purposes. In fact, um, this building here, is an apartment owned by the Am Shinrikyo, 
And it looks rather mundane, typical building. You see the smokestack on top of the building? That's not smoke. That is an aerosol of Bacillus anthracis being spread out over the city of Tokyo. Yet no one knew that Bacillus anthracis was being spewed out over Tokyo. You would have known if people became ill, obviously, but they did not. So, but what was interesting was there was a strange smell from the, coming from the building and there were some ooze coming down the side. The, the residents called the police to intercede, but the police could not be entered the building. So I guess in Japan they have more restrictions than would have in other countries. But they saw some gelatinous ooze and they collected it, tested it for human proteins because the residents thought the smell were um, boiling humans on the roof. Turned out there was no human protein. So those vials just sat on a shelf and were ignored for, um, for more than a decade. After the sarin gas attack, one of the perpetrators confessed and said, well, what about the, the, the bio attack we did as well? So they went back to that ooze and cultured it. And of course, Bacillus anthracis, as many of you may know, forms spores and they can be quite stable. And this is the culture for the, um, that came from that ooze. So connected to that spewing of the microbes out onto the city populace. The interesting thing is the strain is known as the Stern strain. And there's a reason that there was no disease or infection that occurred because the Stern strain is a vaccine strain. And therefore, they used the wrong strain to perpetrate an attack. Now, there could be theories behind that. One is maybe it was, you know, they were testing it before they did an actual event. Or maybe they were incompetent and they didn't know the difference between a vaccine strain and a virulent strain. Or they knew it wouldn't work, but when you have a boss, and the boss says, do it, sometimes you don't argue. And that, that's, so some director general should think about that, right? Yeah. yeah. So the events that occurred and that promulgated us or motivated us forward came off the heels of that anthrax letter attack because we realized we were woefully unprepared. We did not have the tools, the infrastructure to deal with it. So one of my responsibilities was to develop up microbial forensic program, which would be uh, a field dedicated to analyzing microbes or other materials associated with uh, micro microbiological agents that could be used in um, a biocrime or bioterrorism for the purpose of attribution. And attribution can have a wide range of definitions. It could be identifying the perpetrator, identifying the microbe, the etiological agent, what it is for health and investigative purposes, or it could be determining the exact source that it was made and, and, or processed. So we want to derive as much information as possible. We want to know what it could be, and we, at the same time, we want to make sure that we preserve the other evidence, because you may have a microbe, but a fingerprint might be able to give us more information or a credit card statement or some other records, digital records. So at that time, as we always have to think in a multidisciplinary fashion, and microbial forensics is far more challenging in a lot of ways because you don't know what it could be from, what's gonna happen. So we need many different disciplines constantly being involved as no one individual will have an expertise in, in all the necessary areas. We also have to understand that epidemiologists have been forensic scientists far longer than forensic scientists have because they've had the same need to determine a source and trace it and know what it is and that. And so when we think of it from a um, forensic point of view, there are various epidemiological signatures or signals that could tell us whether this is something natural or unnatural. And for time-wise, I'm not going to go into them, but just as I mentioned about the muffins in the break room, it would have been odd to find Shigella. If there was a smallpox outbreak, we would know that that is a bioterrorist attack because there's only two known sources of, of smallpox that are now, and that's the CDC in the United States and Vector in Russia. So between those, if anything else happened, it would probably have to come from that source or some unknown source of time being unnatural. It is also difficult to determine what is a natural or an intentional event because we have a background of noise. There is food poisoning all the time. So the thing with the, with the muffins or the salad bar could be confusing if you're not alert. 
So this background of food poisoning, which is a multi-billion dollar cost per year per country, is going to make it difficult at times to be able to determine that from an investigative point of view. The other problem is it's, it's a huge thing, unlike what we deal with human genetics. So in human forensic DNA has been mentioned, one species, one kind of um, reproduction, it's one set of markers, we can cover all, all the targets around the world. With microbes, there are at least a thousand known agents that infect humans, some worse than others. Imagine having developed tests for every single microbe, just like we did for humans. It would be a, a Herculean task and it would almost be impossible. That doesn't include the 50,000 known plant and animal pathogens that could cause harm to our, our, our resources, whether it's plant, food, and so on. So therefore, we have a real challenge on hand. And this is the paper we published in number of years. This is what I call the tree of death. These are the microbes that are most likely to be pathogenic that have been recognized as high consequence in the agriculture and human area. And so we could at least hone down from the 1,000 to the, what, 100 or so, 200 or so here, but still it would be a very difficult task. Well, so when you're working in the public sector and you're defending, we also have to manage expectations. And when you're not prepared, you might have convey a different image to those you serve, and it's very important that you have to have good response, you have to have good plans, you have to have good policies, and you have to have protocols in place. So it doesn't start just in the laboratory, but it starts at the evidence collection. Because if we don't collect it, we can't analyze it. And if anything else, if we collect it improperly, we could destroy it or we could pervert it. So it's very important to develop different protocols. And I won't have time to go through them, but I'll flash up a couple of slides to show what we can think about. When it's bioterrorism, there will be different places that we might sample. So in the case of the letters that were used in the anthrax attack in the United States, the mailroom became a, a focal point. So you swab that area, the work desks, the other places it could possibly be. And there are different types of ways to do it. Some may be quick and dirty, because you've got to get in and get out. Or they may be very targeted or you know, done in a random fashion, all depending on what prior knowledge that you have to dictate what is the best to do. So you need strategies on how to secure a crime scene and what to do around that as we would traditionally do. Now for the pathologist, who I think is a very important part, is likely many of the pathologists are going to be sentinels to alert us of the potential attack that had occurred. Because often, you know, if you don't know, people get sick, they go in, some die, they die, they end up in Michael's office, or in his lab, and, um, and then um, he has to decide what to do. So first you have to suspect that there's something occurring, and even if you don't, maybe you should be prepared for it anyway. You have to understand the health risks, you have to understand to the responders in the process, and that information is important first for health, the number one priority. In any disaster, any attack, we think health first, safety, and then also what may be useful in our investigations. There are many pathogens and diseases of consequence, and many pathologists may not be aware of that because you typically are aware of what's in your, your geography, your area. So like the anthrax attack, having someone in North Carolina where he died, state in the central part of the East Coast of the United States, is odd, so he didn't expect it. It was actually very fortunate through a differential diagnosis. The, the physician was able to determine that it had inhalation in anthrax for this one particular ind individual, which opened up a whole host of questions. The process, I'm going to say, is always be suspicious. Don't assume, because of conditions, will be, you know, sort of lackadaisical in some sense there, because we don't know when a covert attack starts. Always, of course, wear protective equipment. We have examples, I can tell you, of people who didn't take that seriously and came down with certain very serious life-threatening um, illnesses, clinical histories, all the things that Michael 
uh, talked about or alluded to are important in the process. Um, there are potentially harmful microbes, the ones that we have lists on, and you need proper facilities to handle those. So you need to know as a pathologist where those facilities are, because you may be working in a BSL-2 plus maybe facility, but you may have to think three and four and where that would go. I, get, I chose Bacillus anthracis because it's the one we worked on the most. Why is this a harmful um, organism? Because we can culture it. We can, it, it, we can re produce it in spores so it's stable. So when you disseminate it, it has viability and it can infect people, but it is not contagious. So it's a good bioweapon that won't turn on the one who developed it. So it becomes a very critical one in that. And it has no taste, color, or odor, so you don't know when you're exposed. Unless, of course, you're boiling humans on the roof, and then you know it smells better that way. There are different strategies, and of course, I won't go through them, but hospitals are actually quite familiar with some of these strategies because they deal with nosocomial infections that are routinely occurring, and therefore, there, there are practices. But main thing is, we have to have procedures that monitor the work areas for the pathologists. We also need to collect better the, um, the different kinds of organisms. And I'll skip the, the lethality issues that. There are mechanisms to classify the agents. And I just put some lists up so you get an idea that we have defined different ways to collect them, what categories they are, how to disinfect afterward, what are the control procedures, whether it's anthracis or plague or, you know, Clostridium botulinum, hemorrhagic fever, and so on. Important then is sampling. How to sample, store, and transport. Because in that process, something that you might think you, you are trying to maintain may be taken over, say, in an attack on food. There are natural microbes in food. If you don't protect it in a certain way, those microbes could overtake and hide the signature of the bioweapon. You could deteriorate. Sometimes viability is important because culture is still the gold standard, although that's changing, for identifying um, a, a pathogen. Culture is, has been the standard for about two centuries now, and, uh, but it's slow. It takes time. So we're going to use molecular techniques as well in the process. And then um, how to test various procedures that I won't go into because I have a lot of other things I want to talk about. I alluded to beyond culture, the real way we're going to be testing for now and on the future to get rapid answers where we don't need to know a test for every single microbe but can start in the same process and determine based on its genetic signature what it may be or its um, proteomic signature that it may be. So in the 19th century was the century of chemistry. The 20th century was the century of physics. The 21st century is the century of biology. And it is clear that we are moving in a direction that, that we will do the most. And there's been certain inventions that have made a difference. Until the 1980s, proteins were the easiest molecule to analyze. DNA was very hard. After, since the 1980s onward, DNA became the simplest molecule and the easiest one to analyze. In fact, the invention of PCR, high throughput sequencing, and of course, bioinformatics have made all that possible. Um, I won't go into all this stuff, how it took off. The advent of capillary electrophoresis and fluorescent detection allowed certain things to happen. So at the turn of the century, a decade-long project that cost three billion U.S. dollars and 40 institutions with lanes and lanes of high-throughput capillary electrophoresis sequencers sequenced one human genome. That human genome didn't tell us much of anything. And it wasn't that human genome that actually made the difference, but it built an infrastructure that allowed for in innovation. And shortly thereafter, something happened right around 2006, 7, that the cost of sequencing went from the billions of dollars to a manageable hundreds or thousands of dollars. And that was high throughput sequencing or next generation sequencing, or better called massively parallel sequencing. 
And that also allows us, as scientists, to take what the $3 billion project was done and put it on your desktop and allow you to do the same kind of analyses, not in a decade, but a matter of days. In fact, a day or two now as well. And it's always hard to predict what might be the future, but I think we can predict that this is going to be. So this is the prediction of what the home computer would look like in the year 2000, from 1954 in the year 2004. And they almost got it right. Okay, so they didn't have a knowledge of the technology. You can imagine what's on your phone right now, what this would be. So we always have some blind spots, and we don't know what the next invention will be to make it work. The invention here was the transistor. And they, you know, once you had the computer chip and things, that reduced everything down. They did not know that. And I submit to you that what we're talking about today is technology won't be what we're using a decade from now. There's going to be something that's going to make it faster, better, cheaper. So when the anthrax attack occurred, we had a problem. We didn't have this next generation sequencing. We had the standard one. And we didn't have that technology within the FBI laboratory. So we had to farm it out to a very well-known group called TIGER, the Institute for Genome Research, and to analyze one of the samples that we obtained from the letters, another whole story for another time, cost us $250,000. So that meant we weren't going to type a lot of samples. And through a lot of reasons that I don't have time to go through, through this information, we, we had determined what the strain was that caused the, that was in the, the letters. It was known as the AIM strain. And that was a research strain. And that strain had been sent to laboratories. It was found in nature, but very rarely. But it was picked particularly virulent, so it was of interest. So we knew it was in these laboratories. By sequencing, we had hoped that we would find a signature that we could use to trace from the different laboratories who would have similar polymorphisms in the strain. So very much similar to what we do with human identification. It was hard. But the one advantage of sequence in the entire genome is you're unbiased, because we don't know where the needle is in the haystack of the five million bases to the bacillus and thracis genome. Where were the variants? That was a challenge. But if you could sequence everything and compare it to a proper standard, then one could determine what are the variants that could be the signatures of choice. Once we had done those, another story in itself, and we could identify them, we can then build targeted PCR to type the 1,077 samples that we had collected as potential sources of this weapon and that. And then, you know, use typical PCRs there. Very limited strategy, because as we looked at the variants, we had then targeted, we couldn't find any other variants because we were looking at the whole genome. Pathogen detection had always been based on a diagnostic kit. You know your pathogen, you know your target, you make your primers, you amplify it up, you go from there. With whole genome sequence, as I said, I'm biased, I don't need to know anything. I just have to sequence what I get and figure out what it means from there. Um, in fact, so to just show this, back in 2008-9, I ran a project in which we demonstrated with high-throughput sequencing. It didn't cost $250,000, so we took eight different uh, strains four of Bacillus anthracis and four of Yersinia's pestis plague, and sequenced them in a week, about the cost of about a few hundred dollars per sample. We were able to gen genetically identify them correctly compared to standards. That technology allowed us to reconsider microbial forensics. And so we can expand to other areas, because if you can sequence microbes for bioterrorism, maybe you can sequence them for other kinds of work so we could expand it to whether it's uh, outbreaks or surveillance. The FDA uses this routinely now um, for metagenomics, for cause of death, um, post-mortem interval, and even human identification. So in my lab, we worked on uh, some human identification work where when someone touches something, they leave human DNA behind, but they also leave microbial DNA behind. And our microbial um, composition is a unique signature as well. So we've done a number of work in this area, and based on studies, people 
if you measure their DNA from their microbes over time, it's rather similar per individual, but different between individuals. So we developed a targeted sequencing approach of about 200 plus, um, 286 targets, in fact, that would define uh, the number of species in the, uh, on the skin that could be used in there. And just quickly, um, uh, other than uh, I'll go into skip on the machine learning, using machine learning approaches, we took samples from the manubrium, the chest area, the hand, and the foot, and then we collected from people and then see if we could attribute it back correctly to the individual in a machine learning fashion. And just for quickness, this is the hand, and these are the other uh, sources. And if you notice, the hand actually had the highest accuracy, which was surprising, but great, because I would have thought touching people, shaking hands, and all this, it would distort the, the, um, the metagenomic signature from the hand, and it doesn't, which is good for forensic applications. Um, I'll skip that for now. The genome. The genome now, if we talk about humans, is that complete set of DNA that includes all our genes, and that is what makes us each look what we are, do what we do, and so forth, based on that, that blueprint plus the other factors, the environment. We often talk about genetics, but now we have to think genomics. So instead of looking at one site or two sites, we may want to look holistically and beyond to answer the questions that may be important to us, maybe even going from single omics to multi-omics to be able to better identify or solve the questions that confront us. One of the questions we had, and Michael alluded to this as well, is drugs, exposure to things. When drugs are produced, they're a one-size-fit-all, yet we're not all one size. And so sometimes when we give drugs, there, there's an intent, well, first, there's an intent by the physician that is going to do something positive for you. It's also possible it won't do anything for you, so that's a negative effect, or it can have an adverse drug reaction. Adverse drug reaction are the ones we would like to know about because this is the one that gives us the greatest problems for all sorts of reasons. And it's a complex thing between our pathology, the toxicology, the genetics of an individual, plus the external factors, the triggering factors that may impact the expression that occurs when you're exposed to certain drugs. Pharmacogenetics history has been around, and just quickly, you know, it's been, it was known back in, you know, BC times, with Favism, as you may have been aware of um, from this area. Um, there was, uh, you know, an, by accident, a, a te test, PTC test that some of you will taste it, and it's obviously bitter. I don't know because I can't taste it, so to me it's neutral. So we each have genetics in that, and so on and so on in the development of assays and identifying specific causes. So what we really want to know is, based on your genetic makeup, where there is variation in the response to some triggering effect, maybe a drug, how you're going to respond to have therapeutic success and avoid the adverse reaction. From a medical point of view, in the United States alone, 6.7% of the patients have adverse reactions and 0.3% die. 0.3% doesn't sound like a lot, but if you think of all the patients in a year, that's actually a quite substantial number. So we want to think of the genetics of death because that's something we're interested in, not just traditionally from the pathologist, but also in some criminal investigations. And it's more than just the genetics. You have to be exposed to something, some event or some condition to express as well. You may not express it in your entire life if there's not some triggering event. So um, we have to look at it, as Michael also said, very complex. Sin single gene orders like uh, sickle cell anemia, where there's one valine converted to a glutamine. That's a very easy one to do, but most of the disorders we have are very complex, require a lot of information. So we have a role in that. And I'm going to mention just one set of um, markers in the 
framework that we consider. We're going to talk about the cytochrome P450 superfamily. So it's about 60 genes that are in the superfamily, and they're there for um, metabolism, detoxification, and so on. Six of these genes uh, metabolize 90% of the drugs that we have on the market today. And one in particular that I'm interested for this discussion is CYP2D6, which has about, metabolized about 30% of those drugs. So it's a very important enzyme in the genes in your body. The, there's over 100 alleles, probably more than 150 now. And the different variants will have different impact on drugs, whether you are a poor metabolizer, an intermediate, all the way up to an ultra metabolizer. And so those alleles that you have will convey on you what, how you're going to express and be able to metabolize drugs. The important thing also is that the variants of these different metabolic states are um, different around the world, which can affect also our interpretation. So you can see the ultra metabolizer could be quite high here, you know, greater than 10%. But it's usually in the 3, 4, up to 12% range. I bring up the ultra metabolizer because I want to tell you a story quickly of a nine day old infant who died of morphine poisoning. So the day that happens, that starts a criminal investigation because an infant can't get the drugs themselves. It had to be administered to, to the infant. And it, what it turned out to be was that the mother was given codeine as an analgesic she had an episiotomy during, during birth. And she was an ultra metabolizer. As an ultra metabolizer, she didn't get the effect of the analgesic, but she had produced toxic levels of morphine in her breast milk. And she had been breastfeeding her child the morphine, and that's how the child died. And there's other examples of people going to morphine comas because they're ultra metabolizers. The sad thing is, a simple genetic test would have told us that. And given that you see populations up to 10, 12% uh, frequency of ultra metabolizer, we're failing in the process of determining who should or should not get these particular drugs. But that changed the, um, the investigation from a, an infanticide to an accident, an unfortunate accident. So it changes. So these genetic markers help us in determining cause of death, manner of death, that we would not have known if we did not have the information. It is challenging because when we sequence something, we see a variant, we don't know if the variant we see has anything to do with the pathogenicity or the, the, the ability to metabolize from the protein product that is, that is translated. There are databases, and this is just one of them, where you can go and think about and, and look up genetic variants for very important diseases. To me, baldness is the most important disease at the moment. Okay, you know, okay. And that, but just as an idea of you can get variants that will help you um, interpret what it may be and that. But there are limitations. Um, we don't really know so well what are the significance of some of these variants. And part of the reason is, is that when we get a victim, they're dead, and you really can't do the functional tests that are needed to determine that. But there have been progress made. And um, whether we should look at targeted or do whole genome sequencing, and there's been some, a lot of orphan diseases that have been evaluated and assessed through whole genome sequencing. And there are problems. So depending on the, the third party group that is interpreting the data, it may say there's an increased risk. But if you go to other sites where there may be um, better information, they may consider it benign. So if you don't understand your data, and one of the weaknesses of data is they don't really think about population genetics. And what may be a variant in one population could be associated. So an example of being associated and maybe having nothing to do with it is, if you were married a long time, you're likely to have gray hair. Okay? There's an association. Now, I'm going to argue that being married doesn't cause gray hair, in case my wife is in the audience. But, um, but associations don't necessarily mean cause. And so we have to be very sensitive to these studies. And so we're still in, I'd say, we're further along, but we're still in the nascency of being able to assess these. And it's a challenge, but it is the work that's being done now. 
and in the future. The next thing I'll talk about is now back to human identification, the other technology emerging. This individual here, uh, Joseph D'Angelo, was one of our notorious rapists and murderers in California for over a decade. He started out in the, was known as the East Area Rapists in the late 70s, and then later on as the original Night Stalker in the, in the 80s. Of course, we had no DNA typing capabilities at that time, so it was never linked together. But subsequent to that, these samples were typed, and there was a common profile that linked them together. He wasn't in the database. And if he's not in the database, I might mention also he was a, he was a police officer at one time, which adds a little something to the story. But if he wasn't in the database, none of these crimes are going to be solved through the database search. A new technique was used, and I don't know how many have been following it, but it's called genetic genealogy, in which we're now going to sequence a greater portion of the genome, if not scan the entire human genome. So instead of the 20 some odd STR markers, we're now going to look at maybe 800,000 to a million SNPs. Now with that kind of information, we can interpret a lot more, but you're not gonna necessarily have to look into the database. Now, of course, we want to use a database, this database is very important, but it's not going to solve all cases. So what are the other tools we may be able to use? Well, in this particular case, you can look, and if you scan the genome, we can see how much of one person's genome is shared with another person. And so I can determine your degree of relatedness, uh, in, in theory, up to nine degrees related, but on a practical level, third, fourth, fifth degree relatives. Well, if we look at the number of relatives we have, you may have one or two or three brothers and sisters, but you have many more first cousins and many more second cousins and many more third. So you have a greater reach to help identify the perpetrator or the source of the sample based on the degree of genetic sharing. So these are studies now and these are actually active things there. And what made it possible was we have a lot of direct consumer companies in the United States that where millions of people are um, giving their DNA and getting their information to look at their ancestry, to find relatives, people who are adopted or finding their parents or their brothers or something of that nature. These people can take their DNA out and put it into another database was created as a hobby because if you're in one, data, one company's database, you can't search the other company's database. So they would take it out and put it into this free database that anybody could search um, if they wanted to and search. And so the police use this database, take the DNA profile from the evidence, search the database, and they found a third cousin that matched, uh, that would help lead them back through public records to Joseph D'Angelo. In fact, now there's a kit that allow you to sequence 10,000 SNPs that I've been working on that is good enough for a fourth degree in some in some cases, fifth degree relatives, which now opens the door for amazing searches. But there's a lot of privacy issues and things we have to talk about that I will just end with my last few minutes, and that is informed consent. With this technology, we need to take a step back and understand how we're going to properly use it, because that's always going to be a thing we have to think about, and that is um, what are the ways that we, we heard today, dignity, respect, autonomy, informing people of the risks and the benefits what occurs. Because everything that I think is a benefit could be thought of as a risk by someone else. So we want to be able to put our feet in the shoes of other people to understand what means vulnerable. So in a, a DVI, you, you lose your family member, that person, that family is vulnerable at that time frame. It's not the same as thinking we're just going to help you identify your person. It's about how we are treating them and what we may do to them in that environment. So we, we've addressed this with, the, as I said, respect, beneficence, justice, making sure it's voluntary and comprehended. Comprehended is the hard part. Because giving someone a form and having them sign it I mean, how many of you read those informed consents on the websites or you just check them off and they actually know what's going on underneath them? Um, I'm not pointing any fingers at the moment, but that. So 
Um, there are a number of areas that you have to think about in forensic science. One is research that transcends all disciplines. The other is the reference samples from family members in missing persons or identifying human remain cases. We also have in this genetic genealogy, to facilitate it, the government may go to nobody associated with the case, found this third cousin, but there's a lot of different potential leads and that's a lot of work. So they want to knock on the door of a, one of these unrelated to the case, but related to the source individuals and get their DNA and sequence it. So now you have the police knocking on your door. You might be very compliant, you might also be very intimidated. So these are things that we have to think about. In crime labs, we do validation studies. You give your DNA because you're a part of the crime lab, you don't think about it. But depending on the legal system, in fact, most legal systems, that validation study may be requested, may be reviewed, may be disclosed. And I don't know if the people fully appreciate when they put their DNA profile into a study that that DNA profile may become public. So it may be important for laboratories to have, crime laboratories to have informed consent documents for people in their laboratory who are contributing samples for studies. And then the, um, the one that I'll come back to, I wanted to focus on again, is the family members who may be involved in a molecular autopsy. When you do an autopsy, and if you do it properly, you're basically eliminating one possibility from another to another, and when everything fails, might look at a genetic um, answer for the cause of death. When family, first of all, when, when you have a victim who's dead, they can't give informed consent. So there, there's already one issue there. You're going to sometimes need family members to affect a good genetic interpretation. So you're going to get consent from them. If this, these markers that we look at in molecular autopsy are very different than the markers we look at for typical forensic identification. The markers like STRs that you're using have low positive predictive power. It means if you use them, I really can't tell much about you. With the SNPs or the targeted sites for molecular autopsy, they have high predictive power because you're using them because they may cause harm, they may be pathogenic. We are now in a conundrum in that we have two things there, the confidentiality versus the do no harm. If a physician knows that there is a potential genetic harm to a family, and particularly if there's a therapy or a cure, should they not be telling them because under the principle of do no harm, they have an obligation. So now we have a balance between two conflicting approaches and proportionality will weigh out on what to be done. Not here to say what's the right thing to do, it's just that this is something that confronts us. And the last will be um, getting reference samples from sources other than typical forensic sources. In a number of countries, newborns are tested for a number of genetic disorders. And those, sa those samples sit. And there have been cases where they have been drawn to use for investigations without necessarily being under the proper conditions, all for good reasons, not for bad reasons, but they do have an impact on the, the use of these and we have to think about them. So when we think about informed consent, we have to talk about the benefits and as scientists, we all know what the benefits are. It's going to solve a case. It's going to reduce um, some um, symptoms in a treatment or something like that. But we don't always talk about what the risks may be. And the risk may be disclosing data, opening up data that's to someone who may not be ones you thought would get it. The risk could be um, the lone wolf who goes out there and compromises the evidence in your crime laboratory. We, we, it's really strange for us to think that way because there's a trust, there's a belief in doing the right thing in our disciplines. But there are people who have violated that, and so there's a risk that we have to think about if that were to occur. And then there are people, as I mentioned, who may not see it the same way, whether it's by population, by education, by gender, or by the event at the moment that might be less, may be compromised at the time put that in place. So put yourself in their position, think about it, and then we balance it out. It's not an all or none. There still is the weighing out of the benefit versus the risk, but by informing people, we're in a better position 
to do what we believe is the best for society. In that. So with that, I'd like to stop and you know, thank uh, my colleague, Auntie Sayantala, one I work with very closely on a number of these issues, Vanessa Lynch, uh, who exploits me for every meeting she can, um, the, the African Society of Forensic Medicine, and particularly around the Forensic Laboratory. Without them, we wouldn't have a meeting. And that's so I really want to appreciate them and the big to them all. Thank you. You can just stay up here for a couple of questions. Thank you, uh, Bruce. Uh, incredible always to listen to you and to hear how succinctly you, you can summarize complex issues. Um, I always want to make sure that there are a time for questions. So what I've done in my mind is I've allotted if a speaker leaves extra time, then we take a question. So please, if there are questions for uh, Dr. Bruce Badoli, just put up your hand and we can... Or anybody talk. else who spoke. <laughs> I'm going to pass it on to Michael because he knows it better than I do. So just put yeah, up your hand. Yes, Uam, please go ahead. Thank you, Bruce. Um, that was beautiful. There's so many things to unpack in your presentation, but I will just focus on one, and maybe we continue at the sideline. Now, um, aside from response mechanisms, uh, what measures will you suggest for surveillance and prevention of potentially biologically, um, biological agents that could have forensic significance in Africa? Because most of our Response, I mean, in Africa, it's we respond to problem when it's already happening. Yes. But, I mean, you remember the Ebola in Lagos and a, a doctor sacrificed mm -hmm. our life. So how could we have a robust surveillance system using forensic tools within Africa? Mm -hmm. What are your suggestions in that regard? It's a very good question. In fact, most of the time we respond and prevent because that's the human nature that puts us in uh, difficult positions. There are a number of things that can be done and, um, but it's, it's a difficult question. So one thing is you have to define what's a harmful agent and at least from the laboratory perspective, know who has those agents. So in the US, everybody has to register now. Before 9-11, you could put something in your pocket, get on an airplane, no problem. After 9-11, if you had it in your hands, you're guilty till proven innocent because it really went the complete opposite. So it has a dynamic on your Proof, guilt versus innocence proof as well. A number of things to be done, and I think really you need to engage your, either your agricultural health or your public health, because they will be the first responders. They were the ones who see it first. So in the US, we have a laboratory response network, which is also shared with a number of countries around the world. And they are the first ones who will see something, detect it, and immediately if it has a signature, which may or may not be a true signature, and I can give you examples of that why, it will then be immediately sent up to one of the septic laboratories at a BS3 or 4, as it may be. I think that's really the most, first most important thing. Second thing is, is to develop protocols and policies to properly, I had some slides on it, but I didn't have time, because she was going to yank me off at, nine, at one minute, or she threatened me. That, but um, that how to collect the samples, how to store them, how to ship them, get the proper media that's necessary to maintain the integrity of the samples, and then maybe have designated centers of excellence for diagnostics. It's a huge burden. You know, you heard Michael's talk, he spent $500 million for a facility. They're not cheap in that. And then, you know, um, I think you have to invest in sequencing technology because it's one platform that allows you to take on very different sort of um, targets where beforehand I needed a different protocol for this, I needed a protocol for that, I needed a protocol for this. The last is education. Information. One of the things, and I'm sure many of you are aware of this, you're not the ones who speak when a, an event occurs. It's, it is a mayor, a governor, a parliament, or a person who has no knowledge of what it is. And I can tell you in the 9-11 tack on the World Trade Centers, the mayor of New York City got up and said, you know, to identify the victims, which I was deeply involved in, got up and said, we need family members. He said, parents and children. Brothers and sisters are of no value. And I was sitting there saying, well, 
That's dumb because brothers and sisters are of value. Uninformed people, so what you could do is produce the literature and documents and pamphlet styles, short videos that could inform them so that when it's ready, they pull it off the shelf and read it to send a better message out because you're not the one speaking in that. And I think that will help a lot too in response and also prevention because you educate people at the same time. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Bruce. We are uh, answer. Unfortunately, I, there are no more time for more questions. I want to say that during the break, please touch base with our speakers. Uh, as you go for coffee, please return at 10.30. Uh, a part of being respectful to people is also being respectful to their time, which I have really tried to do this morning. I want to call on the speakers while the rest of you are walking out to, to grab your coffee. If the speakers of this session can please join me up front so that we can generate a, a session photograph for the organization. And I'm inviting Jules, uh, Dr. Charles Karangwa to please join us also. Thank you, delegates. Murakosi, merci, thank you. So can I ask the speakers to just move to the front so that